1972, during one of Apollo 16's spacewalks on the surface of the moon, NASA astronaut John W. Young received some news from NASA. This looks like a good time for some good news here. The House yeah. passed uh, the space budget yesterday, 277 to 60, which includes a vote for the shuttle. Uh, wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Tony, again, I'll say it with absolute. I'm proud to be an American. I'll tell you, what a program and what a place and what an experience. Yeah, and I'll say it too. So am I. The country needs that shuttle mighty bad. You'll see. Young was ecstatic to hear that the next era of NASA spaceflight had been secured. Following the end of the Apollo program, focus was now shifted to low Earth orbital infrastructure. We needed to spend more time in space, learning things, building things, and improving things before we ventured further out into the cosmos. The vehicle chosen for this mission was the Space Shuttle, and in 1981, John Young would be in the cockpit of Space Shuttle Columbia for her debut flight. With 135 flights over the course of 30 years, the Space Shuttle was the foundation for an uncountable number of firsts, too many to list. Instead of that, what I'd like to do is talk about some of the more outrageous, controversial, and entirely true moments of NASA's longest standing flagship. We'll start off slowly. The first fact is more believable the more you think about it, but at first, it sounds a little crazy. Imagine you're an astronaut who's been helped into a flight suit, gone out to the pad to see and hear a powerful explosive machine waiting for you, gotten aboard that machine, and been strapped into your seat effectively laying down. From the point the shuttle's hatch is sealed, you have two hours for the launch team to go through all possible safety checks and finish filling the vehicle with immense amounts of explosive fuel. In those two hours, what do you do? According to NASA astronaut Marsha Ivins, many just take a nap. It might be hard to imagine being relaxed enough to sleep in such a stressful situation, but Marsha as well as astronaut Leroy Chow laid out several reasons for this phenomenon in an article for the Smithsonian. First, one must consider that they are already in a laying down position in their seats, and the flight suits themselves are actually designed not to stand in, but to sit in as they are on the pad. Furthermore, especially for a mission specialist, Marsha states that, quote, the truth is there isn't much to do for those two hours after you climb into the shuttle. Many astronauts just take a nap. You're strapped in like a sack of potatoes while the system goes through thousands of pre-launch checks. Occasionally you have to wake up and say Roger or loud and clear. Chow added that, quote, this is kind of a time to relax a bit. The environment is totally familiar thanks to the hours spent in the simulators. For once, nobody is talking to you. Nobody is asking you for something. It's not unusual to doze off. At least one of my followers was somewhat skeptical of this information when I first presented it to Twitter, I'm not calling it X off, and I can imagine why. Anyone who knows much about NASA and crude launch procedures knows that, most of the time, safety is the top priority. Every single inch of the launch vehicle is being looked over by every possible person at every given moment, not to mention constant checks and rechecks being performed by multiple different kinds of flight software. Constant awareness of everything going on is of paramount importance, and dozing off in your seat seems like exactly the opposite of constant awareness. However, one must realize just how many people are keeping an eye on launch safety, and how little the astronauts themselves would be able to aid in this effort. There isn't really anything that they can see that wouldn't also be seen by someone or something else on the ground, and the appropriate actions would be taken. In this situation, the crew become like passengers on an airplane, except they're sitting in the cockpit, while the pilot is sitting in a building nearby and the pilot is a team of 50 people being backed up by 200 other people, and a suite of software both for them and aboard the vehicle itself. Everything is being taken care of, so for the astronauts, it's time to kick back and relax, like Marsha is here in orbit aboard Shuttle Atlantis. Speaking of sleeping on the launch pad, the following is a summarization of the words of James Van Hoften, Mission Specialist 1 aboard Space Shuttle Discovery on STS-51I in 1985. 
Imagine you wake up on the day you're supposed to launch aboard the space shuttle. You look out the window and it's pouring down rain. And I mean pouring. Thick sheets of rain are hitting the ground, curbs are flooding, the grass exists in muck. You realize very quickly that you will not be going to space today. There's absolutely no way that they'll launch the shuttle in this weather. However, there's been no official announcement of a scrub as of yet, and you're surprised by that, but it means that right now, you have to go through the motions as usual. Once you're in your flight suit, you head out to the van that takes you to the launch pad, and you're doing something no shuttle crew has ever done before. You're wearing big yellow raincoats to protect your flight suit from the pouring rain. You think to yourself, what are they doing here? The shuttle is filled with fuel, a hulking vehicle groaning and straining as it prepares to explode in the middle of this insane weather. You get on board, and it comes time to strap yourself in. One of the other astronauts tells the technicians to just go away. They know how to strap themselves in. Just shut the hatch. We're not strapping in right now. We're just going to hang out here until they scrub the launch. And so, that's what you do. The crew lays around on the back of the shuttle's flight deck and goes to sleep. You just need to accept that you're not going to space today. You wake up around T-20 minutes, and there's still rain out the window, so you relax again. Then, Mission Control gives a go for launch. And all positions uh, have given uh, Flight Director Cohen a uh, go for uh, launch this morning. Again, uh, still observing the weather. T-9 minutes and holding. This is Mission Control, Houston. The crew, confused and now very alert, strap themselves into their seats and get ready. STS-51I blasts off on schedule, and later, when you look down on the launch site from orbit, you see a hurricane. All of this actually happened to James Van Hoften. The crew were convinced that they would not launch due to an encroaching storm front, didn't strap themselves in, and then briefly panicked when the weather cleared just long enough to allow them to launch. That calm area in the storm would later form into Hurricane Elena, which the crew observed from orbit. Perhaps the most metal launch in the shuttle program's history, though second when we include other programs. There's nothing more metal than your rocket being struck by lightning and surviving. Now, from metal launches, we move on to metal astronauts on a metal return to Earth. Let's think for a moment about the process of atmospheric reentry. When a spacecraft descends back into Earth's atmosphere, it's traveling at orbital velocity, just over 7 kilometers per second, and in order to land safely, it has to slow down. The easiest way to do that, especially when you don't have an excess of propulsion during the return flight, is to use the atmosphere itself. As the craft pushes against the air, it's slowed down, but because of the intense speeds of re-entry, it also needs to be able to survive the drag, the mechanical stress, and the aerodynamic heating caused by the compression of the air in front of the vehicle. Earlier spacecraft use a blade of shielding that would absorb all of this stress into its dense materials and spit it out little chunks at a time. The shuttle instead used thermal protection tiles that would absorb the stress over a much larger surface area, negating the need for a blade of materials. Nevertheless, it still involved falling into the air and pushing against it so hard and so fast that the air is ionized in front of you and turns into bright streams of plasma. It is, to say the least, a scary thought to go through the process of atmospheric re-entry. One would think that safety would once again come into paramount importance just like during launch. Stay seated, stay strapped in, follow procedures, and hold on tight. Which would most likely be true, unless your name is Story Musgrave. Musgrave joined NASA during the era of Skylab, working on the design and development as well as being slated to visit it, but he never got the chance. Instead, Musgrave went on to fly a remarkable six space shuttle missions and became the only person to fly on every single orbiter of the fleet. He was mission specialist aboard Challenger on STS-6 and STS-51F, Discovery on STS-33, Atlantis on STS-44, Endeavour on STS-61, and Columbia on his final flight, STS-80, in 1996. During that last flight, Story did something nobody else had ever done before, and decided to stand up. He remained out of his seat and unrestrained for the entirety of atmospheric reentry and landing. According to the biography about Musgrave titled Story The Way of Water by Anne Lenahan, Story had been asked by fellow crew member Thomas Jones to assist in some filming before entry interface when the process of reentry began. At around Mach 20, Story was supposed to go back down to the mid deck where his seat was and get ready for landing, but he just didn't. Instead, he was standing at the back of the flight deck with his camera, filming the stream of plasma through the rear windows as the shuttle tore through it. 
He wasn't connected to the cooling for his flight suit, that was down in the seat, and at age 61, after over two weeks in microgravity, he was standing up calmly while experiencing five sustained minutes of 1.7 Gs on his body. Thomas Jones was, quote, flabbergasted, and would occasionally glance at the back of the flight deck, laughing every time he saw that Musgrave was still there. He stayed there all the way until Columbia's wheels touched the ground. Jones states that he believes that Musgrave simply wanted to go out in the best way possible, to experience as much of the shuttle program as he possibly could. That was the kind of person Musgrave was, and still is. The weirdest part of all that? It wasn't even the first time. Musgrave stood up through most of the re-entry and landing for STS-6 as well. Say what you will about it, the shuttle program was an impressive thing. It held many firsts, and it went on just long enough that the astronauts got a little creative with it. Yeah, sure story. You were just testing to see how the body adapts from microgravity to normal gravity. You were doing science. Nobody ever has fun in space. If you enjoy this content, consider hitting the subscribe button. If you really enjoy this content, consider donating on Patreon, becoming a member, buying some of my books on Amazon, or buying some of my merch. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you over the curve, Space Cowboys.